Welcome back to my YouTube channel, everybody. My guest today is Mr. Phil Bertelsen, who's the director and producer of the Netflix TV series, Who Killed Malcolm X? Which is, of course, about the murder of Malcolm X. Thanks for your time, Phil. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Well, your series is getting a lot of media attention again these days because two people um, are, have been exonerated and they were previously convicted of the murder of Malcolm X. Therefore, we're going to talk about this uh, as well. First thing I would like to ask you is, how did do you guys come up with the idea of making a TV series on the murder of Malcolm X? Well, as documentary filmmakers, we're always spitballing ideas. And, you know, this was one of many that was kind of thrown into the hat um, during a producer's meeting. Uh, one of the ARC media producers, Hannah Olson, actually suggested uh, that this book uh, written about Malcolm's life called Life of Reinvention. It was a, a biography written by Manning Marable, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning, in fact, and talked a lot about uh, the circumstances around Malcolm's death and even uh, named a man who was known to be a living, hiding really in plain sight in Newark, New Jersey, which is not far from New York City, where we all live and work. And um, so it became something of, of an intrigue to maybe reinvestigate this crime if in fact uh, one of Malcolm's assassins went unpunished um, and was living out his life not 25 miles from where we we were talking at the time. So that's kind of what ignited it. And and we went on this um, you know, research path to to find out more. And, and in the course of doing that. Um, came across the name of a man, Abdul Rahman Mohammed, who you see in the series, who himself had been spending the better part of his adult life um, uh, searching for this man. He, in fact, gave Manning Marable this man's name and identity um, based on his own research. He's mentioned in the book. Um, and he was one of the first people we reached out to, to to learn what he knew. And we quickly learned that he knew more than anybody. Um, and he was working at the time as a security guard at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. Um, and so by the time we started to work with him, he was in fact a tour guide at Arlington National Cemetery. So he was, he was every man and he was a citizen scholar and historian and, and he became our guide uh, through, through this story. Um, and, and that's how it all began. Okay, so based on your research, why did in your opinion, the Nation of Islam want him that? Well, Malcolm's relationship with the Nation of Islam was at that time fraught um, because Malcolm had um, not only been uh, banished from the nation or suspended, um, but he began to tell the truth about the leader of, of that organization, um, a man by the name of Elijah Muhammad. Um, and Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad had a falling out. They were at one time like father and son, um, and Malcolm became his, his fiercest alkalite, um, his national spokesperson. Um, Malcolm was believed to have been the, the heir apparent um, to the Nation of Islam. Uh, if and when the then ailing Elijah Muhammad were to die, uh, Malcolm would have in all likelihood been the leader of that organization, which commanded the loyalty and devotion of, of many, many thousands of African Americans. And um, so it was a significant organization. It was a black nationalist organization um, and it was a religious organization. Uh, so, you know, sometimes it gets confused as, as being an organization based on civil rights advances, but really it was faith-based and, um, and Malcolm was its, its fearless leader. Uh, by the time he left the Nation of Islam, um, he had said some disparaging things about Elijah Muhammad, called attention to um, some infidelities, um, and, you know, really showed a disloyalty that the, the flock, if you will, um, saw as heresy. Um, and, and Malcolm knew um, that by being outspoken, he, he might, in fact, be um, taking his life uh, or risking his life, I should say, and um, even said that he himself thought he was a dead man walking 
and indeed he was. Um, so it was really uh, Malcolm's willingness, openness, candidness um, to speak out against the leader of the Nation of Islam that, that put him on this basically path to death. We now know from your work also that one of his bodyguards was actually an undercover NYPD agent. So as far as you know, did he keep the information he got to himself or did he share it with the other investigators of NYPD and the FBI? Yeah, so Malcolm's organization, after he left the Nation of Islam, uh, he formed two organizations. One was faith-based, the other was political. Uh, the political organization was called the Af Organization of Afro-American Unity. And it was that organization that was infiltrated by uh, a man by the name of Gene Roberts, who was then an undercover operative of the New York Police Department. Uh, they had a Bureau of Special Services and Investigation, which was a complete rogue operation um, where men were recruited um, to infiltrate um, organizations like Malcolm's. And he, in fact, was his bodyguard and was there in the Audubon that day, uh, gave Malcolm mouth to mouth um, after his bullet riddled body fell to the stage. And um, it was a real tragic tale um, for him, in fact, uh, him being Gene Roberts, to learn that his um, superiors, um, when he did in fact tell them what had happened, uh, they, they questioned him. Why would you give him mouth to mouth? You're not there to save his life. And it was very baffling to this man. He didn't realize, I think, that in fact, they seemed to want Malcolm dead. Um, and they got what they wanted. And he ended up a broken man. He, um, he was exposed as an operative years later um, during a trial uh, for the Black Panthers here in New York. It was, it was called the Panther 21 trial. There were 21 Black Panthers put on trial for you know, various and sundry you know, things that, again, another organization that law enforcement and the government were heavily surveilling and infiltrating. Um, and it was during that trial that he, he was exposed as having been an undercover operative his career then with the NYPD was over, and he died a broken man. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a sad tale. He thought he was there to serve and protect when, in fact, he was not. Well, let's get to the main question then. Do you think the investigators were part of the, of the conspiracy to kill him or like even just maybe uh, letting it happen or not? Well, you know, after the series aired, and the evidence that we presented um, provoked the Manhattan DA to reopen the case and reinvestigate the circumstances uh, around Malcolm's death. Um, they discovered um, a great deal more evidence than what we actually provided um, that suggested there was some collusion uh, on the part of law enforcement and the FBI um, at worst. Um, at best or least, in the very least, uh, 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 gross prosecutorial misconduct. There was evidence that, that was um, not shared uh, with the prosecution on the part of the FBI that would have probably, uh, at least in the minds of the DA, um, led to these men, um, in, led to this man's innocence. The two men that were wrongly convicted, uh, uh, Khalil Islam and Muhammad Aziz. Um, so, you know, is it proven? No. Beyond a reasonable doubt? No. I think there are still some questions as to the, the veracity and the intention of law enforcement when it comes to Malcolm's life and death. Um, it is very clear that they were not um, fans of Malcolm, that they were derelict in their duty to protect him. Um, and we go to great lengths to show that in the series. Um, and if the DA, DA's office uh, didn't um, believe so, they probably would not have exonerated these men. And so there's a lot left to be said and, and discovered um, about how much, why, um, and you know what reason um, the, the law that law enforcement um, 
was interested in seeing Malcolm dead, if in fact they were. Well, two innocent people were convicted for the murder of Malcolm X. But why did that happen? Like, was it a human mistake, something that just can happen, or the need of the investigators to divert media attention from their mistakes, either deliberate or not? So at the time of the crime or currently? At the time of the crime. At the time of the crime, uh, um, you know, there was a lack of interest on the part of law enforcement to protect Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm was an antagonist to law enforcement. Malcolm spoke openly out against police brutality. Um, he, um, he was a thorn in the side of law enforcement, to say the least. He was someone that J. Edgar Hoover, who was the head of the FBI at the time, found to be a great threat. Um, he issued a memoranda to his many agents in the field that they were to do something about Malcolm. He had this great fear of what he called the Black Messiah, um, who would, you know, lift up and 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 resurrect, you know, the Black people in America. And you know, that was not something uh, the FBI wanted, um, and uh, so they sought to kind of disassemble, disparage, and um, discredit. Malcolm and anything he was associated with um, and in so doing um, failed to protect him when his life was in danger, uh, as indeed it was uh, for, for many months uh, leading up to his assassination. Now, these two people, Norman 3X Butler and Thomas 15X Johnson, have been exonerated also thanks to you guys. How does it feel to be part of this chain that led to the exoneration of two innocent people? Uh, it's it's exhilarating to think that you know our work had that kind of impact you know and we didn't do this work alone we didn't do it in a vacuum there was you know scholarly research you know that we built on um i had a team of producers working with me my producing partner directing partner rachel dretson and shayla uh and and naila and and of course abdul rahman all contributing to this outcome um but you know you you set out to to just be honest and tell the truth and and and, and give a, a version of history that has not been presented before and you hope that um you know people will listen and 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 watch and and indeed they did um and so we're grateful that that happened and uh, it was due in no small effort to to the david shaney's the attorney for the wrongly convicted and the innocence project who who took on the case alongside the Manhattan DA. So it was a it was a it's a group effort, you know, it takes a village um, to do that sort of thing. And and we're we're we could not be uh, more thrilled to have rewritten that wrongly written piece of history. So you already said something about this, but I would like you to elaborate. These two people are not the killers. So who are the real killers? Yeah, so Thomas um, Johnson and, and Norman Butler, now known as uh, Muhammad Aziz um, and Khalil Islam, who has since passed, um, were wrongly convicted, railroaded um, for reasons that are still unknown. Um, but as far as the real killers go, um, the man who did do time alongside these other two wrongly convicted men, who in fact um, had a gun um, and fired it, um, named four other accomplices in an affidavit um, at the time of the crime. But uh, I should say, I, 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 let me correct that. He, he stated that these two men on trial with him, uh, Norman Butler and, and Thomas Johnson, were not his accomplices but he stopped short of naming who was. So consequently, those two men were convicted alongside him, wrongly so. But he did say at the time of the trial that they were not his accomplices. When he was asked who were, he just kept quiet for years. Um, but some point later in the early 70s, we're talking four or five years later, um, he confessed the names of the men who were his accomplices. 
um, but nothing was done um, to pursue them um, at that time. One of the men he named was a man by the name of William Bradley, who was known to be um, a real thug and um, the man who fired the kill shot, the shotgun assassin, the man who leapt up in the front row with a sawed off shotgun and, and fired you know, innumerable shots into Malcolm's chest when others came and converged on the stage with pistols um, to finish the job. That man, William Bradley, was the man who was hiding in plain sight in Newark, as I mentioned, who we were on uh, the hunt for um, to confront him about all of this when he died. Um, so none of these men, the others who were named in the affidavit are all dead. Um, none of them were questioned, tried, or convicted, obviously, for the crime. So they went free um, all this time and, and, and went to their graves, having committed this, this horrible crime and, and, and never saw justice for it. What was the reaction of Malcolm X's family to your TV series, in particular his daughters, if you know? Well, one of his daughters, Ilyasa Shabazz, um, is in the film. Um, and was a very strong proponent of the work once it was completed. Um, you know, the truth about Malcolm's daughters is that, you know, there were six of them. Four of them were born and alive and in the ballroom that day. Two of them, twins, um, were in their mother's womb. Um, so they were all at the Audubon, some in utero, some full-fledged young children there to witness this crime and they've had to relive this trauma every time the story comes back into the headlines um there was a sense of gratitude that we brought some truth and justice to to their father's uh death um but i do think there's still some you know unfinished business there um where the family you know more than anything, you know, is, is, are the people who deserve some redress, some justice and retribution, and then that hasn't come yet. Um, sadly, um, one of the two twins who was in utero at the time of their father's murder died herself within days of the exoneration. Um, and, you know, it just, you know, it adds insult to injury, to be honest, when Malcolm's now youngest daughter, who he never met, um, is lying beside him and his wife at the Ferncliff Cemetery in, in Westchester, New York. That was so sad to hear and read. I completely agree with you. Well, I've been studying conspiracy theories for 15 years now. And one thing that I've always found fascinating about this case is that it didn't spark the usual conspiracy craze that follows these kind of events. Let me explain this. Like in the case of the murders of the Kennedys or Tupac Shakur or John Lennon, there are conspiracy theorists who claim that there was an extra shooter that was not cut or there were body doubles, or it didn't happen with Malcolm X. And of course, I'm not trying to spark this um, the other way around. I'm very happy that in this case, we don't have this kind of crap to debunk. But uh, what are your thoughts about why didn't this happen this time? You know, actually, that's partially true. There, there were plenty of conspiracy theories. None of them really um, rose to the level of consideration that some of these others that you mentioned did. Um, I, think, I think there was a, a very clear understanding that, you know, not only did the Nation of Islam, you know, conspire to kill Malcolm, fire the guns, um, but there was this other conspiracy around them that, you know, took advantage of this dissension, this, um, this war between Malcolm and the nation. Um, and so there was always this idea that, you know, the nation of Islam may have fired the shot, but uh, law enforcement loaded the guns. Um, one conspiracy theory, though, to your point, that I, I, I have heard um, that was being propagated by a man named Dick Gregory, who was a great comedian and activist and um, 
and leader. He claimed that the Nation of Islam didn't fire the guns, but that there were men in some catwalk, you know, CIA agents and federal law enforcement who shot Malcolm from above. Um, completely debunked because there was nowhere above Malcolm in the Audubon ballroom to fire from. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it was not just the Nation of Islam who um, who conspired to kill Malcolm. And, um, and that's the rest of the story that, you know, I think needs to be told. It was bigger than that. It was much bigger than that. One thing I failed to understand is how big his impact on the American society was when he was alive. The uh, reason why I'm asking this is that, as you know, I'm Italian. I was born in the late 70s, and I've only heard about Malcolm X in things like rap songs or TV series such as The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. But it's not something you study at school, so I don't know. So I'm asking you, how big was his impact on the society? You know, uh, you know Malcolm is is more relevant today than he ever was. And, and the truth about Malcolm and his impact on American society and the world at large is that his, um, his position on humanity is, is timeless and, and always ahead of its time. Like we're still catching up to what Malcolm knew and understood about um, our life, our struggle, um, and, um, and for that reason, he'll always be relevant until which time, you know, we actually um, meet the demands that he was making um, 50 plus years ago, which cost him his life. Um, so Malcolm's never fallen out of relevancy. He's maybe gone in and out of popularity, but among many of us, particularly African Americans in this country, he, he's always been an icon. Uh, and a beacon of truth and, and justice. And, uh, you know, we do what we can to keep his story alive and honor his legacy um, so that uh, one day um, he can rest easy and know that his work was done. Well, we know that in today's world, the racial tensions come to the headlines every now and then. It happened in the 90s, it happened very recently. So what do you think is Malcolm X's legacy in today's world? You know, if Malcolm were alive last summer, 2020, um, he, I should say if, I'm, if Malcolm were allowed to live, I don't think last summer would have occurred. And I think Malcolm would have been a world leader of such proportion that he would have made enough change to not have to keep reliving the brutal past of racism and um, injustice that is inflicted on, on black people in this country. Um, you know, the same is true for other slain leaders, but Malcolm in particular, who spoke out against inequity, against uh, uh, police brutality, um, and just overt systemic racism um, might have garnered some, you know, achievements that would have preempted, you know, the George Floyd, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, you know, the list is long of people who lost their life um, at the hands of, of racist police or, you know, citizens um, in this country. I don't know if that answers your question, except to say that, you know, because he lived the way he did and spoke truth to the power of the, the way he did, um, we're all reminded that, you know, there's much work left to be done if, if we continue to, um, you know, live in this um, abusive uh, society. Well, Phil, many thanks for your time and for giving us these insights on your investigation and on your TV series and also on your thoughts on Malcolm X. Many thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time. Thank you, everybody, for watching this and see you next time.